Um, so I have a lot of slides, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be fast in what I present. Um, and what I'm finding, I'm, I'm going to try not to be too provocative, but I think we live in provocative times. So I'm going to try to match the moment that we have in our country right now. Um, what I'm also going to be doing, many of you know me as uh, in my role as API Data, which is we at MSNC call me Dr. Data. Right? <laughs> but I'm not going to move away from data and that level of expertise and that as part of my brand. But what I'm going to be uh, talking about today is work that we've been pioneering at our Center for Social Innovation um, that is place based work um, that we think that the uh, API community can benefit from. So, this is something, this is a framework that we built uh, last year as part of our nonprofit leadership training. Uh, and um, look forward to uh, sharing that with you today and, and getting your feedback. Uh, so in addition to sharing the API commissions, I'm um, also a board member of the California Endowment uh, and direct API. So CSI, uh, it's not a TV show. <laughs> we do have a very good uh, media and cultural studies department with uh, people that have good skills. Uh, but it's about it's the Center for Social Innovation. Uh, there's a reason why we call ourselves the Center for Social Innovation. So here I am at Silicon Valley. Please don't think I'm poking you in the eye when I say this. Um, when you ask people where is innovation happening in California, you ask them to drop pins on a map, most likely you're going to find the highest concentration here, right? Silicon Valley. That's where people think of uh, predominantly when they think of where is innovation happening. Now, some people who may a little, know a little bit more about other kinds of tech hotspots might point to Los Angeles in terms of entertainment tech there, or to Irvine, right, in terms of high tech and some biotech there, and certainly San Diego and biotech reach down there. That's predominantly uh, the, the, the pins that they will drop on the map. By contrast, when people think about inland California, they're not thinking about innovation, right? The adjectives that come to mind are problems, challenges, corruption, hardships. Now, this is not to say that these don't exist in our region. By the way, they exist in coastal California too, right? Including probably within a five mile radius of here. You have many of those same issues. But that's not the dominant image here. So why is it that that's the dominant image from where we are? So that's part of the reason why our center got started uh, a year ago is to change that narrative, but also to draw attention to the kind of leadership that exists in the Inland Empire, as well as other parts of Inland California, and importantly, to drive investments uh, to our region. So one of the things that I, so yet another of the roles that I've taken on, uh, as of four months ago, is that I'm a co-founder of Inland California Rising, and that's an attempt to bring together leaders from the Central Valley, including uh, Ashley Swernovitz, former mayor of Fresno, she's the head of the California uh, Central Valley Community Foundation. Michael Tubbs is an amazing leader, mayor of Stockton. He's pioneering universal basic income in one of the larger municipalities in the country, uh, as well as leaders in the Inland Empire. And what we're trying to do is to show that we are investment ready, right? So to the extent that there are investors here, or at least people that know investors here, if you worry about the future of California and the social good uh, that, that needs to be generated, um, you don't need to look that far. Right? You can look at Central Valley, you can look at the Inland Empire. We would love to have you come down to where we are uh, and, and, and get to continue this conversation. Now, why am I here talking about the Inland Empire? Right? Some people ask me, why are you doing this? You've built a pretty good brand uh, as a kind of national spokesperson on Asian American issues for founders. You run the National Asian American Survey, API yeah, Data, that's all important work that needs to be done. And this seems so different. But the kinds of challenges that we see are very similar to the kinds of challenges you'll find in the API community, right? One, in the empire, we live in the shadow of a much larger entity of LA. For Asian Americans, when you say we're communities of color, first of all, people don't even know if that's true. But even so, they say, well, Latinos are much bigger, African Americans are bigger and stronger, and they've been here for a lot longer. Why should I pay attention to you? So that's a challenge. Another challenge, by the way, I'm going to just speak some truths that are uncomfortable truths today. Right? Um, we have an under-resourced nonprofit sector in the Inland Empire. We have over 10,000 nonprofits in this two-county region. 
And the vast majority of them have budgets below $50,000. This is also true of ACS and UNI. A lot of small nonprofits. And there's no way, you know, mergers and acquisitions can work in the corporate sector. It does not work in the nonprofit sector. Right? You have generals that are in charge of very small armies of one or two and a bunch of volunteers. That's the state of our nonprofit sector. And then finally, our philanthropy is not proportionate either to the need or to our giving capacity. This is true in the Inland Empire. It is absolutely true of the ACS. So we are trying to change all of that in our region, and we're hopeful that the kinds of things we learn there, we can apply it to ACS communities and vice versa. At least that's what makes me whole, right, in terms of trying to figure out these two important parts, not only of my identity, but the civic work that I and our center does. So some solutions include strategic narrative work, nonprofit leadership and innovation, and then finally innovation and philanthropy. And that's where we came up with this idea, this framework that we're rolling out uh, this year, uh, more largely the API community. And this is this framework of data, narrative, and action. Now when we first, by the way, so our center got started a, a year and a half ago, very two very generous grants from the Irvine Foundation and Weingart Foundation, uh, to do this place-based work. And so one of the things we said we would do is nonprofit leadership training. And we said we would focus on some of our core areas of strength, including uh, data and research, uh, including uh, messaging, framing messaging and, and narrative work, and then finally uh, work on civic engagement, including voting and other forms of political participation. We have all of these different things, and we, we're trying to package it together we were trying to come up with a frame that would be catchy. By the way, one of the things that we did not do, which a lot of Asian American organizations do, is come up with a whole bunch of syllables strung together. So that's something we also need to work on. Because most people outside our community have no idea what the alphabet soup of Asia organization is. Like I said, I'm just going to spit out some truth today. So what we came up with is actually something very simple and catchy, and we found it to be useful not only in our work, but when I present this, I presented this at the National Conference of State Legislatures, they find it useful. I've talked to CEOs, and they think it's an interesting and useful even for their own strategic work, uh, which is to think about not only data. So a lot of people come up to me and say, I need some data. And my response is, what are you trying to achieve? Because there's a sea of data, but you need to figure out what your strategic action plan is first before you go trying to search for data. Um, and importantly, you can't just stop there, right? Often, first of all, data is important. Without data, and if all you have are examples, those are anecdotes, right? So, and, and some of those may be really powerful anecdotes, but policymakers and investors want to see more systematic data, right? To see how that particularly compelling story that you're talking about is representative of some larger phenomenon. So data, of course, is important. But often for APIs, we fixate on data and don't do enough narrative work, right? So data without narrative is not meaningful and it's not memorable. So we don't have that narrative, right? Some of, the, some of that is about storytelling. But narrative work is more than storytelling, it's more than messaging. And I don't have time here to do like a full-on workshop on narrative change, but narrative change also involves framing, and it's difficult work. Some of it try, involves agenda setting, and you know, anyone who was how many people here were involved with the public charge issue when it hit, right? That is an important issue. It continues to this day. By the way, there's this One Nation Commission that would not earn my stripes as a commissioner if I didn't say the public charge issue is still alive. But it was so difficult. We know that Asian Americans, Asian immigrants were the ones most affected by public charge. But that issue did not catch fire in our community. We also know from our survey data that gun control is a major issue among Asian Americans. But after Parkland, I did not see Asian Americans out in the streets. Even something like the Muslim ban, I'm sad to say, the kind of images coming out of the Bay Area, it was mostly white people in those airports mobilizing. <laughs> Now, when I said this to some colleagues, they're like, ah, there were Asians there. They just strategically did not. <laughs> <laughs> right? And this is not to say that we don't show up, but we are not showing up given the nature of the moment right now. We are living at a time.
time in which progress has been turned back in some pretty significant ways. And it involves us in such a powerful way, especially when we talk about immigration. And the fact that we are not out there, we are not in the forefront, some ways we're outsourcing some of the social movement work for Latinos that we should be doing ourselves. So it's important, right? And that's where the action piece is so vital uh, as well. Some of it is advocacy, civic engagement, but some of it could be as uh, you know, as, uh, as basic as, as funding. In terms of attracting funding, especially from larger mainstream funders, we need to have a strategic action plan. So that's part of our curriculum is, our simple question is, what is your DNA? And this is not asking people to go get a 23 and meet kit. <laughs> like I have some issues with, at least concerns about privacy and whatever, whatever they do with that information. But this is to ask, what is your data plan? What is your narrative plan? And what is your action plan? And how are they working in concert with each other? So that's, if there's anything that you remember from today, I hope you take that with you and see how useful it could be to make your organization stronger, uh, to make your uh, movement stronger, whatever local movement uh, that you're a part of. But say a little bit about this in action. So one of the first reports that we put out was the state of immigrants in the Inland Empire. This had a mix of quantitative data as well as community profiles. Importantly, it wasn't just a report that sat on the shelf, right? Uh, it's something that we distributed far and wide to policymakers throughout the Inland Empire, and it came at a critical time. This is when a lot of municipalities were debating uh, resolutions against SB 54, which is the so-called state sanctuary law last year. And I'm proud of a lot of the immediate impact that we've had with our API work, right, in terms of New York Times, NPR, et cetera. But sometimes getting coverage in local newspapers is so important. And what made us really proud, this is something that we've never been able to achieve in our national work, is the day after our report came out, or maybe two days after, we got two-thirds of the front page, right, in the Riverside Press Enterprise. Now, the Riverside Press Enterprise is owned by the Southern California News Group, and they own a bunch of properties from LA Daily News to Long Beach Press Telegram, and they own four newspapers in the Inland Empire region. By the way, Inland Empire, four and a half million residents. It's pretty big in terms of population. But what was amazing is we literally got wall-to-wall -wall coverage that day. Right? <laughs> And this is something, some of the things I'll tell you sounds like luck. There's aspects of luck. It so happened that our report was coming out at the time in which you had these Tea Party years and Trumpers like showing up to city council and just bashing immigrants throughout Southern California, throughout our region. Um, but sometimes it takes relationship building with, with journalists, with editors, and having the kind of community support to create this kind of positive echo chamber that can then lift up our stories. And I'll give you another example. In a minute. We're gonna be talking about census today. So I'll just tell you, so that's, a, that's an example of uh, not only the data that we put together, but the it was strategic narrative engagement, uh, leveraging the kind of relationships that we had with journalists and editors to make that possible. And that continues in terms of our work with the census. So our center, has built trusted relationships with the nonprofit sector as well as with government actors. Now, that might not be, um, maybe easier to do in the Bay Area where I think local governments here are generally cognizant of the importance of community and at least I think somewhat progressive, if not fairly progressive. We were able to convince the San Bernardino County Board of Supervisors as well as the Riverside County Board of Supervisors and these folks over here, the really conservative folks, to build a complete count committee with us. So our center, I'm, I'm, it's an additional title I have. One of these things is like I have a bunch of titles that I need to start shedding some of them and finding other people to take over. But I'm also the director of the Inland Empire Complete Count Committee. So that itself was a feat. But importantly, see, one of the things within, in, uh, among Asian American communities is we, we, we are told not to be loud or speak up, but we're also told not to brag. I was to say, my mom bragged a lot, and I'm glad she did. <laughs> because, see, 
seriously, we do so much good work, but if people don't know that we do this good work, it actually will hurt you in terms of funding, in terms of media coverage, in terms of impact. So that's something that we just need to get out of that habit. Being told that you should not brag, like, it's the art of the humble brag, right? <laughs> <laughs> we need to know how to do it strategically and to do it well. So again, we got front page coverage, and this time, the big deal, so usually with reporters, you can't say, hey, the census is important. It's like, okay, fine, maybe we'll do a story, but it's not gonna be front page. The big deal front page thing was you had both of these counties, instead of going their own way, they were gonna come together and build a complete count committee for the entire region. So that was a big deal. And we're continuing some of that work. You know, we, so there was, a, there was a OC Orange County Register story that featured me as well as other partners Part of this too is when reporters call, I connect them with, with community organizations that I know are gonna be articulate and, can, and are also quick on the draw. When a reporter emails you, try to respond within an hour or two. Because by then they've moved on. They have deadlines. They're not like academics where deadlines are flexible. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get it done right away. So try to be quick on the draw. That's one of the reasons why I get called a lot by reporters is reporters know, either from their past experience or they, they can tell that if I contact this person, I'm gonna get a call back very soon and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna have to sit and talk for 15 minutes. Uh, within one or two minutes, I'll, need, I'll get what I need from this person and then move on and write that story. Right? So, but even so, even though that was a really great sense of story, it was not a front page story. Right? So, we don't, we, we're not always going to succeed, but it's so important for census. What I would say is one of the challenges you should put for yourselves individually as organizations is to see if you can get quoted in a census story sometime in the next six months, either on television or, uh, or in print. And try to make that happen. Support each other. Make sure that your story gets told. One of the ways we, the incredible opportunity we see in census is this is an opportunity for our communities to know ourselves better, to build our applied research and data capacity, and to get media coverage, and importantly for general audiences to understand our regions better. Most people who read the newspaper, especially newspaper and print, are not young people. It's the city council members, the heads of the chamber, right? So you wanna make sure that you're grabbing their eyeballs uh, to show that you matter. So I'll say a bit about API data. How many people here have been to API data's website? Okay, so hopefully more of you will. Um, we started in 2013 um, after the 2012 election. So uh, I was part of the National Asian American Survey in 2008. That was the first national survey, nationally representative survey for Asian Americans. Did it again in 2012. And what we found after 2012 is that more and more reporters were interested in Asian Americans even after the election. Usually you would get this kind of peak of interest before the election and then it would drop off. After 2012, partly because you had this national exit poll finding showing that Asian Americans, after African Americans, had the next highest level of support for Barack Obama because there was a lot of interest. Like, what's going on? We thought they were Republicans. No offense, Buck, I know, you're still holding on. <laughs> But there's a lot of interest. People are like, who is this community? That was kind of like our coming out, right? In terms of national prominence. Um, and so what started API Data was actually a call, uh, there was a reporter from The Economist who called me and he wanted to know something about the Vietnamese American community. He was gonna do some story uh, in terms of uh, a race in Orange County. And I said, okay, well here's some key features, there's some generational differences. I said, you can find out all this information, just go to Fact Finder and you can get all this data. I mean, first of all, reporters, most people you know, do not like to interact with American Fact Finder. It's kind of a painful tool to interact with beyond going, getting, just getting the basic information. But what they want is expertise of credible expertise, right? So what I realized is that a lot of reporters could benefit from some quick and easy access to data as well as research that's written in an accessible way. And so what we feature on our website is not only demographic data, but also policy research done by academics as well as by community organizations. 
So check out our site. If you go to deeper dives, if you think that there's a report that we've missed that is done in a credible and, and, and systematic way, we will add it. Uh, but just let us know. And you'll find our contact information on our website. In terms of our team, it started off as just Sono Shaw and I. Uh, but in the last year and a half, we've added uh, Jennifer Lee, who's a professor at Columbia, uh, Janelle Wong, who's a professor at the University of Maryland, as well as Sunny Shao, who's a PhD student at UCR. So you can get our contact info there. We want people to engage with the site and the resource and to help us improve in whatever we put out. One of the things we do is work on infographics and blogging. And this is one of the things that's kind of depressing as, as someone who's an academic. So when I started off, you know, my, my dissertation was something like, I don't know, like 350 pages, something like that. And I have a few books out. So I still produce books, right? But when I, uh, my first job was actually at the Public Policy Institute of California, which is a think tank in San Francisco. And the first report, or the second report that I did, it was like 200 pages. They're like, nah, it's way too long. You need to like, we're going to have a 100 page maximum in terms of what you can do. So I was like, all right, fine. By the time I left PPIC in 2005, uh, that's only, within three years, they're like 20 to 25 pages. No one wants to read anything longer than that. It's like, all right, fine. But even then, what they said is really what matters is the two pages and the press release. Like that, I, that's what you should be aiming for. Most people are not going to pay attention to the rest. Where we are today, and it's kind of depressing, but also just shows you how we need to reorient what we do. Most people don't read our report. What they read is that headline and, and they see that infographic, and they're not even looking at the numbers. They're looking at shapes. You have about three or four seconds to grab someone's attention, deliver the message, because they're going to move on. This is one of the things we found, too. We've, we've dabbled a bit in terms of data videos. And what we found, especially on Facebook, is that after eight seconds, there's a big drop off in attention. Okay? So you need to deliver that message really quickly. But I'm proud of the work that we've done. Right. So this factoid, one out of every seven Asian immigrants is undocumented. How many people knew that, by the way, before? Well, most of you now will not forget this, right? And this is part of our data and narrative work. We package the data together in a way that once you hear something, it'll be sticky. We have members of Congress using it. And we know that we originated this idea because no one was saying it before we did. And it's something actually quite simple, right? So my grad students, they, they use all the latest programming tools and statistical software. It's like super sophisticated stuff. But this is literally take a numerator and paste the kind of denominator you would use. Most people try to think of the total immigrant population, or total undocumented population, 11 and a half, 12 million, something like that. And they say Asian Americans are one and a half of those. And normally that's where it stops, right? They don't even produce a ratio. What we did is we swapped the denominator to say, let's take all the Asian foreign born as a denominator and put, put the Asian undocumented as a numerator to produce and it's powerful, right? Because you can say, I mean, this may not apply to a room like this, but if you're in a room of Asian immigrants, chances are that one out of every seven people in that room is undocumented. And that's just so important for us to understand ourselves, right? One of the, one of the biggest problems coming out of DACA is a very low uptake of DACA among Chinese immigrants. There's a lot of denial within the community, but also a lot of stigma, right? Unlike in the Latino community, in which coming out as undocumented, literally you had a lot of queer undocumented activists who were the forefront of the youth leadership movement and, and immigrant rights uh, among Latinos. Among Asian Americans, especially in the Chinese American community, especially through Chinese both traditional media as well as social media, people are actually further stigmatizing the undocumented population, pushing this narrative of a good immigrant, people came here the right way, not realizing that there's so many Chinese Americans that are also part of the undocumented population. Right, so some of this work that we do is to not only show that we matter, that we exist, but also to hold the mirror towards our own community to do some of that important work that needs to be done internally. By the way, for something like this, again, we didn't do the research. There are actually very few people who are expert on Asian undocumented. This is someone, if, if people are thinking about grad school, um, 
this is, these would be good topics to study. You know, we are the fastest growing undocumented population in the country. And just mirroring the kind of demographics we see, we have very large Indian and Chinese undocumented folks in the country. But very few people even know who they are, what they do, what kind of challenges they face. There's just very little research. That said, Migration Policy Institute has put out a bunch of state estimates of the undocumented population by various regions of origin. Sono and I, I called up Sono that morning when I saw that, I was like, okay, let's produce a bunch of infographics. So this is in November 2014. And these infographics were so simple. I mean, this was like a summary statistic, summary graphic. But all we did was take a vector file of the state. It was like two tones. What you'll find in a lot of this stuff is like black and like orange, or black and yellow and black and red. That's what you would see on all the sites, right? But we had a vector, vector image of like Illinois or California, large, large font, the number of undocumented, what share of the total undocumented, what share of the Asian immigrant population they represent. And we circulated this via social media. We got a bunch of uh, other community partners that lifted it up. And then within a matter of two days, I had a call from NPR Weekend Edition that did an interview with Scott Seidman, right? Now again, some of this is luck. Some of this is finding the right moment to, to push something through. But some of it is also just planning ahead and creating this positive echo chamber. I cannot emphasize to you the importance of that. But that's one of the things that I think is great to see the kind of audience here, the number of organizations that are engaged. Think about the kind of positive echo chamber you can create for Asian American Pacific Islanders in Silicon Valley, in the Bay Area, to make sure that larger communities are cognizant of, of the needs and contributions of this community. You'll find other data tools on our site, like Quick Stats. Which are uh, geographic sortable tables of uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders. Uh, at the uh, we have at the national level, we have at the state level, county level, congressional district, and metro area. We're going to be changing the look and feel of this in the next uh, couple of months, but this is the bare bones framework that we're going to keep. We also have created this thing called geographic profile. And by the way, uh, there's a new site that we that we've launched. We launched it last week called racial data, because people said, you know, how about doing this for other communities of color? So we're, we're starting with that. We're starting with this data tool in which you can, you can choose a geography, you can choose different groups, and then you literally just say, create a report, and then you can download it to the answer. Um, we have it based on the uh, uh, American Community Survey's five-year files, but we're going to expand it uh, to include uh, comms data, we can talk later, is. But anyway, uh, we're going to try to get more detailed Asian origin uh, into this. With our current data set, it's hard when you go down to smaller levels of geography to do that consistently. I'm going to run out of time, so I'll just say a few additional things. In terms of key data points that we use, that our community tends to use in terms of why do we matter, uh, one is growth rates. Uh, we love growth rates. So and we kind of like tape our way that we might not be the largest group, but we're fast growing. Right? But in the Silicon Valley, Asian Americans are, of course, the most important. Uh, we're one of the larger groups, period. But it is true. We are the fastest growing group. Uh, it's true nationally. It's true in California from 2000 to 2010, and then from 2010 onwards as well. Our purchasing power has also increased substantially. These are the kind of things you would see in a Nielsen report, for example. So we're at about a trillion dollars in consumer uh, purchasing power similar in magnitude to African-Americans and Latinos, right? So even though we're smaller, uh, our wealth uh, ends up being an advantage. And that's usually what marketers tend to use to say, pay attention to us as a, as a consumer market. We're also growing in terms of wealth. Now, when people look at statistics like this, I know, you know the, the Pew Report in 2012 talked about the high income, high education, high and growing wealth. And of course, and I'm going to talk about the importance of data disaggregation in a minute, of course there are areas of disadvantage in our community, but we cannot ignore the enormous wealth in our community, right? And especially when it comes to our social responsibility and our civic responsibility, and especially given economic inequality in our country today. So these are the kind of statistics that are usually trotted out in trying to make a consumer market case for Asian Americans, but of course there are problems. Right? So one, 
And by the way, I, I'm not gonna judge anyone who watched this movie or loved it and bought out entire theaters so that all their friends could watch it. That's an important move in representation. But we should also recognize the limits of that kind of representation too. Right? So first of all, it should not have been called Crazy Rich Asians, it should have been called Crazy Rich Chinese. <laughs> I mean, did you know that the majority of Asian Americans today are brown Asians, South Asians, and Southeast Asians, and not East Asians? Yeah. Right? And that's been true for more than a decade. And yet, when it comes to representation, that's the dominant image. And these have consequences. We have survey data which show that not only among Asian Americans, that this is even more dramatic among whites and blacks, is when they think of Asian, they don't think of Asian or Pakistani. That's a big problem. There are all sorts of things that flow out of that. New York Times did this video. I know I'm running out of time. Okay, I'll just say this quick thing. New York Times did this op-ed video, right, in which there was a Metro editor who got like yelled at, said, go back to China, and he was like, wait, I'm Korean. <laughs> <laughs> Only on the East Coast, they're like, wow, race exists. Right, so he did this big story, and then they did this video, right, in which different Asian Americans were talking about their experiences of discrimination, and it was all East Asian except for one Filipino. There were no South Asians. Right? And most of, the, most of what they were talking about was microaggressions. This is in the context in which you have Sikhs getting shot at and killed. People being pushed on the train tracks because of their association, their mental association with terrorism. Right? So it, it is consequential. So we need to be cognizant of that. By the way, even if you're trying to look like Singapore, there are brown people in Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> right? So this, and again, I don't need to say, so this is where um, Viet Nguyen talks about narrative plenitude. We need more and more stories so that we're not pinning all of our hopes in one story, but we also need to call, call out misrepresentation or selective representation within our community. So we look at the diversity within our community, so yes, we have wealth, yes, we have higher educated folks, but we also have predominantly Southeast Asian refugee populations, right, including Burmese, by the way, a fast-growing refugee population with relatively low levels of educational attainment. English proficiency varies pretty significantly, and it doesn't always line up. So Chinese Americans might score relatively high on educational attainment, but they score relatively low on English proficiency. And that matters, including for something like census. Pacific Islanders. You know, it's not just about breaking up Pacific Islanders as a group. Whenever possible, try to disaggregate within the Pacific Islander population, and you'll see differences, right, in terms, for example, just a lack of health insurance, Native Hawaiians are better off than Tongans and Samoans, right? And that's important. It's important to pull these out whenever the data permits. Which is why it is so painful to see protests predominantly in the Chinese immigrant community against data disaggregation. So these are pictures from Rhode Island. These are pictures from Minnesota. Throughout the country, you have especially Southeast Asian groups that are doing this important work of saying, let's disaggregate data, especially data in terms of data at the, at the high school level, right? Data in terms of health disparities so that we can better understand and tailor programs to meet the needs of our community. And you have this pretty vibrant movement now. It started off as opposition to affirmative action, and then someone, that someone actually happened to be Ward Connerly, who did a lot of work in California, to say not only did he kill affirmative action in California, he tried to push a so-called racial privacy law. Do people remember, remember this? He tried to push a law saying you cannot trust the government to use any data on race because they will, they will automatically discriminate. So we need to ban all racial data collection. That thankfully failed in California, but this strategy has found its second coming to the Chinese immigrant community. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just being wild-eyed about this. This is ha these are policy fights that are happening right now throughout the country, including, I mean, it's happened in localities in California, right? I was part of the California API uh, Commission where we championed AB 726 and then later 1726. We started seeing this opposition among a very vocal minority, but that minority is growing over time. 
Now, what does that have to do with census? Well, the same folks that are fighting data disaggregation are now fighting what they call the Asian checkbox in the census. And it's so, um, I can't say it's ignorant. I think it's willfully and deliberately ignorant and misrepresenting. Why our community for 30 years has been fighting for disaggregated checkboxes on the census. And in fact, there's, the, the, some of this came up in Minnesota in which some of the local conservative activists said, well, we'll just not check off, we'll just tell people not to check Chinese. This way we can still get our kids into Harvard. Like this sounds ridiculous, but that is the logic. Don't check off Chinese and you won't be discriminated against. It's like, do you know how racism works in America? That's not how racism works in America. And so now you have this big campaign for Asian Americans, but predominantly among Chinese immigrants, not to check off the Chinese box. Now just imagine what that'll do if you're a local hospital trying to figure out what kind of languages you need to support in a remote county. You are not going to provide Chinese language support. Right? So I'm an immigrant myself, I get these expressions wrong, but I think that's cutting off your nose to spite your face, right? I think that's what you're trying to do. But it's really harmful. And in fact, if you look at census, census department's own survey, it shows that Asian Americans are actually the ones least likely to say that they're going to fill out the census. They have the greatest anxiety about how that information is going to be used. So we have a major problem. And this is something that we're trying to get in front of funders to say that when you think about a census problem, don't just think of the Latino problem. In fact, Asian Americans are the only racial group that are majority immigrant. And in some communities, we've had you know, 20 to 30% of our community that's immigrated since 2010, who have not had experience with the US census. So it is so important for us to do this level of outreach. So in general, we need to think about census as part of this larger framework. And I think this is where I'll, well, actually I'll say one more thing before I quit, um, <laughs> where we need to think of census as so important, as an important part of that continuum of evaluation. So 2020, we're gonna have voter registration. The primaries will matter, especially at the presidential level for California in ways they haven't for a long time. GOTV is gonna be important, contacting public officials, getting ready for redistricting, so the Citizens Redistricting Commission, I think, they're, I think they're opening it up. I think on Monday is when applications are being accepted. Last time around, 50% of the applicants were white males. Right? We need to do a much better job in terms of engaging communities of color, engaging women, uh, to make sure that we are part of that redistricting process. And even if we're not chosen as a commissioner, we need to have our communities engaged. And that's one of our hopes for census is that as people have this on the ground applied data and research experience, that we can have much more robust engagement when it comes to redistricting. Of course, running for office is also important. And then finally, philanthropy is important. So let me just fast forward to that. So first of all, voting, we're still behind. Contacting public officials, we're very far behind them. So elected officials, it's not, it's not just voting that matters. What happens between elections is so important and they're much less likely to hear from Asian Americans than they are from non-Hispanic folks. And finally, we also need to advance in philanthropy. So it's great to have Buck in the room because I usually just speak for him. I'm gonna speak for you even today. <laughs> Where, this is an example from, from the Bay Area. Uh, so the charity drive that the San Francisco Chronicle does during the holidays between Thanksgiving and Christmas, it's the season of giving, and they, they try to get as many people to, to give. Right, to those that, that are struggling to get by. If you want to think about what you would expect in terms of our share of total giving, you might look at our share of the population in San Francisco and San Mateo counties. This is roughly the readership of the San Francisco Chronicle. So we're about 32% of that population, 28% of those with incomes over $100,000. You would think, oh, maybe discounts it a little bit, maybe something like 20% of donors. Buck did the number crunching for us, and what he found was only 2.7% of major donors and only 1% of all donors. This makes me worried about the future of California, and I hope it makes you worried about the future of your local community and the future of our state as well. So there's something that we need to do about it, and that's going to be my 
kind of obsession over the next five years is to figure out how, what can we do to turbocharge? Remember that rough data that we saw, right? In terms of the number of uh, people with net worth of over $5 million, we have 10 times that size of the African American population in this country and twice the size of the Latino population in this country. We need to get engaged. And so there are some efforts. So I'm, engaged, I'm involved with Project Uplift. I'm happy to talk about that more later. Uh, the National Asian American Community Foundation is launching later this month. And that's an attempt to try to get creative and to really scale up uh, the work of community foundations that are actually pretty small, right? We have the Asian Pacific Fund in the Bay Area, you have the Asian Pacific Community Fund in LA, and the Korean American Community Foundation uh, in New York that has started to expand a little bit, and the Bay Area Community Foundation. These are pretty small foundation efforts. We need to do it, uh, we need to scale it up in a much uh, much bigger and more dramatic way. So I'll just leave it at that uh, at the end. Uh, so back to the slide of when we think about census and all the other conversations we have, we need to think about empowerment and what role our organizations, what we as individuals are gonna do to make sure that we fill out this picture. Census is an important place to start, but it can't stop.